The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Who has clean hands and a pure heart? Who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully? He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your hands, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Confused. I thought Wesley had more to do. <clears throat> Evidently, I had a coffee break before since I did this last. Uh, Got to retrain me. This has been a happy and a sad week. I'm 
I'm so elated that my buddy Mel has crossed the finish line. <laughs> it hasn't been but just a week or two that I looked him right in the eye and said, don't you dare beat me there. I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> now I guess I have to hurt him. <laughs> so I'm going to live up to that silly word. I'm going to read. I'm going to adjust what I have to say this morning. I want to talk about the Psalms. It's easy to adjust when we're reading and studying from the book of Psalms. What I'd like to do is, over time, get a feel. Oh, thank you, Dave. Get a feel for David's heart, David's feelings, his attitude toward God and his, his desire to serve God. Is it up there now? I want to start in the 23rd Psalm, which I think is, that's kind of the hinge point of David's heart, his mind. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I wanted to read that myself before I have my young men read. Because I want to think about this concept of the Lord being the chief shepherd, which Peter repeats. He says, when the chief shepherd appears, and he's referring to elders and the elders' responsibility as shepherds over the church of the Lord. When the chief shepherd appears, he will, he's, he's going to make judgments about how those men and the people uh, related to one another and how well they serve him in their service. He makes me lie down in green pastures. There is plenty to eat in the pasture of the Lord. I remember Ron and I talking with Mel about this concept of constantly being in the pasture, feeding on God's Word. Tracks throughout the pasture should be seen by us because we constantly wandering, feeding, on God's Word. It's not something that's static. We can move anywhere and read in God's Word and gain nourishment from it. He leads me beside quiet waters. Peace comes from God's Word, the quiet waters. He restores my soul. Only God, we were talking about spiritual poverty this morning. Only God can restore our souls. We can gain physical strength. We can do a lot of things to keep ourselves healthy in this world, but only God can restore our souls, and that through Christ Jesus. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. What is right the standard by which all of us should live. He guides us in that when we feed on this pasture through which he leads us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I have no idea when and where the end of my life will come. I have no idea what dangers I will face. I do know one thing that I need to be strong no matter what those shadows or where those shadows appear in my life. I fear no evil. The closer that Mel and I 
came to that day that he has already come to. A stronger idea. There are times when we face things that make men tremble. But I look to David, even as a youth, this young man had a courage that he got from fearing, trusting, and loving, seeking the Lord. I fear no evil, for you are with me. If I could pass one thing along to everyone here, we are never alone, ever. That is both a, a, an encouragement and a fearful thing. Because there is no moment when you can look over your shoulder and do something evil because we are not alone. We are being watched at all times. Every thought and action that comes from me in this physical body is recorded and reported to God. David seemed to understand that reality of life that he was never ever alone except when he fooled himself from the roof of his palace Never, ever alone. So when and if we decide to do something secretly where we are looking over our shoulder, if you are looking over your shoulder, rethink what you're about to do. Because we are never alone. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I know I've said this before, but that rod and the staff were the same instrument with two different ends. God could punish and kill as the great shepherd with the same instrument. With the hook, he could save. With the rod, he could kill a wolf. The rod and the staff is a comforting thing. In Hebrews, it tells us that we should enjoy or appreciate, uh, not enjoy, that's the wrong word, appreciate our discipline. Because if we are not disciplined, we're not sons. The King James says we are bastards. We don't kind of use that word much anymore. But I think that's a shame because Every word has a proper place to be used. And if you don't use the right word, you're not blowing back your hair like it should. We nicen things up so the Bible doesn't say the things that it really says, so that we don't offend anyone. But it's supposed to offend when we're not obeying God's word. In chapter 24, I'll get you guys to read now. Someone read the first two verses for me. Please. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Any of you remember the movie um, Finding Nemo? One of, <laughs> one of the best movies I think ever. My grandkids just watched it over and over and over. And I remember the seagull. Mine, 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 mine. <laughs> Always fighting over over mine. We spend our lives with mine, mine. And it's not mine. Everything here I've been allowed to use 
for a short period of time. And guess what? I am judged by how I used whatever it was that I had in my hand. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and those who dwell in it, we are the Lord's. And like Marty put it this morning, we can be gentle, take that power that God has given us to do whatever we want to do. It's called free will. He's given us that power, and we can do whatever we want to do. But we will be judged. The world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Then he asked question. Who? Who may dwell in the hill of the Lord? Who's qualified to dwell where God dwells? Who can stand in his holy place? Then he answers his own question. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who has clean hands. You know what Pilate did? To rid himself of any of the guilt of killing Jesus, he did what everybody knew was the case. Wash your hands of this deal. I'm out of this. I can't be held accountable. Only God can wash our hands. Only the blood of Jesus can wash our hands. As a matter of fact, David, when he would write this, how could David write such a thing without condemning himself? Well, how can I even read that? Because all of us are guilty until we're not. All of us are guilty until we have our hands cleansed by God. All of us are guilty until we have our hearts purified by the blood of Jesus. You know, David... I don't know when he wrote what. I can, I can tell you how he felt at the time when he wrote what he wrote. But even when he, he says this, this could have been right after, right after Nathan pointed that finger at him and said, you are that man, O king. And then said, but God has forgiven the guilt. Right after that, David could have said this and felt good about it. But we talked about consequences. And that's what I want to make sure we understand. The fact that David could write this and had clean hands and a pure heart doesn't mean that 10 minutes earlier he had clean hands and a pure heart. We have to approach God in the proper fashion to get that cleansing. It was different from David. David had to do something different than we have to do. We are required, required. Jesus said, unless you do, you can't. We are required, if we have not done this before, we are required to do what he told Nicodemus had to be done. We must be born again. You can't get there from here in this frame, in this body. That's what being poor in spirit means. Knowing this body is going to die and turn back to dirt. I don't know when. Honestly, I've been praying for Mel to leave this world. I love that little man. I hated to see him suffer the way he was suffering. 
I'm upset that I don't get to sit with him and hear his wit, his dry humor. <laughs> oh, I am going to miss that man. I can't tell you just a short story. If I've told this before, bear with me. I'm, I'm reminiscing about my buddy. We were coming back from taking a young man to uh, Libby. And uh, we were driving the mountain road up, curvy mountain road, 60 miles an hour, and we met a triple truck. And it was like two feet over into our lane on a curve and almost ran us off the road. And I pulled it back, and gravel was going off the side of the mountain down there like that, and got pulled out of that curve and on the straight, and I looked over at Mel, who hadn't uttered a sound, and just sitting there looking. I said, how'd you like that truck? He said, I bit the seat. <laughs> just so. <laughs> His humor just... It was a wonderful thing. I said, <laughs> no, I won't say that. I won't go, I won't go there. But it. David asked these questions. He says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, I don't know when David said that. But I know that David did not say that before he knew he was cleansed. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, God. Who seek your face, even Jacob. David refers to God's people in a number of different ways. He refers to them as Jacob or Israel. And usually when he's talking about, when he uses Jacob or Israel, it's because of their shaky stand before the Lord. He calls them Jerusalem. It's usually a better, a better tone to what he's saying. Lift up your head, O gate. You know what the gates were? The gates were where the elders met. The, el the gates were where the cases that did not go to the king were settled by elders of the city. The gates were where the, the righteous men gathered. It's where everybody went to get justice. It's where Absalom went and said, if I were king, I would give you what you want. These gates were the foundation of whatever civilization existed inside the city. And David is saying, lift up your heads. Look, wake up, O gates, you leaders of God's people, that the king of glory may come in. That is when a city or a people can count on longevity is when they let the king of glory come in. Who is the king of glory? David writes. The Lord. The I am. Strong and mighty. The Lord. Mighty in battle. You know, <laughs> this is what amazed me about the history of these people. They had 20 kings in the north and 20 kings in the south and one queen who usurped the position for a very brief time. About half of them in the, in the south, in Judah, were good, partially. And not one of them, not even one was good in the north. Lift up your head, O gates, 
Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Selah. An interlude for music. It's time for music right here whether it be sung or whether it was played by instruments in David's time, that's where the music came in. You know, I, I like the thought before I sing. Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Because there it describes what God asked for. He asks for us to sing and make melody with our hearts to the Lord. To teach and admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. All of these things written by David. The psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs written by this king who was pleading with us to let the king of glory come in. I don't know how many of you remember Ernie. One of the people that we baptized here through the, the work that's going on now in, in Hope, but at that time it was at Jan and Carol's house. Ernie Exley. <laughs> Ernie was one of the most outstanding men. He, too, a diminutive giant. I love that old man, too. Still do. He still, I still love Mel. Matter, matter of fact, but Ernie said that he went to a, a Baptist church. He was he was going there because it, it was the place to go. He said he wanted to sing and and he liked to sing, but he said I I couldn't sing because the drummer was so noisy. I could. And he said, finally, they put the drummer in a box so that they could put the sound through and they could adjust the sound of the drummer. I said, why'd they have a drummer? And he said, because they wanted one. I said, what was the drummer teaching? What, what, what was the drummer teaching us with words with these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, a psalm is what we're reading here, and most of it has to do with praise to God, praising God for all of the things that we know God does for us, the beauty of the world, and, and everything that we so often take for granted. The psalms teach us that. We, we read these songs, we sing these songs, and when we sing them, the words come back to us, and we teach and encourage one another with the words that we sing and the melody that comes from the human voice. I read something the other day where uh, science has discovered that the human voice has more beauty, capability, than all of the other instruments combined. I'm telling you, I, I, my wife went to a Celine Dion concert one time. And she said that she was introducing the members of her orchestra. And somewhere as she would have them play. And as they were playing, Somewhere in their playing, whatever instrument it was, they would stop and she would continue imitating that instrument and nobody could tell when. The most amazing musical instrument and that's what God asks us to use. Now, I'm not making big judgments on anybody about anything I'm telling you what God asked us to do let the king of glory come in Psalm chapter 25 we're running out of time guys 
Somebody read uh, verse 3. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Go ahead and read some more. That wasn't the whole thing. Make me known your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of, sal of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. You know, David, there's a lot of things that happened to that man in his lifetime. A lot of good, a lot of evil, a lot of, a lot of things that he had no control over. And only one period of time was he unfaithful to God. Only one time in his life that I know of that he was so deceived that he could not see that he was disobedient to the Lord. And I say that, but then again he says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away all day long like the fever heat of summer. He was wasting away inside because of what he did. He had talked himself into doing. He says in Psalm 25, Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Waiting, waiting. The ability to wait. You know, when we need it now, when we have to have it now, that impatience will get us into trouble. We have to have it now. What is it that we're looking forward to in the end? Do we trust that God will give us what he promised to give us regardless of what gets taken away from us at this particular time. I think about Abraham and the promises that God made to Abraham. Get up out of Ur, go to a place I'll show you. Give up out of Haran and go to a place I'll show you. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you. How many times did he say, I'm going to give you? And Abraham waited. Finally, in chapter 15 of Genesis, God tells Abraham, I'm going to give it to you, but not for 400 years. <laughs> what? Lord, what? You know I'm going to be gone by then. The promise. The promise that Abraham was going to receive was not going to be him. It was going to be through his children. The promise that he was going to receive was that through his seed, the Lord Jesus would be born in this world and save all of mankind that would open the gates and let the king of glory come in. What did you read last time? Huh? You read 2.5? Make me know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Remember in Psalm 23 it said, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all day long. Go ahead and read six and seven. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness' sake, O Lord. David's getting pretty picky right here. Remember, remember, don't remember. <laughs> Telling God what he wants him to remember and not remember. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion. How many times did 
do you remember reading in the New Testament where it says that Jesus looked and he felt compassion over and over and over again? Same I am. Same I am. He felt compassion then. He feels compassion now. He says, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. He's already been told that he was forgiven if this is after Bathsheba. But David never asked for the consequences to be removed. Did you realize that? I don't know of anywhere that David ever asked for the consequences of his evil to be removed. It was a constant reminder to him of what happened to Saul and thankfulness to God that God did not do to him what he did to Saul because God still saw in this young man, even as he began to be an older man, this willingness to come back to him and humble himself. According to your loving kindness, that word, I don't know why they translate it loving kindness in some places and mercy in others. Mercy. I understand what mercy is. Loving kindness? It's a little grayer to me. But I know that mercy means overlooking what I've done wrong. Forgiveness for what I have done wrong. According to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness sake. O Lord, because you are who you are, O Lord. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Think about this. He's referring to Israel as him here, his troubles, because the children of Jacob, the children of Israel, remember, remember what Israel, somebody tell me, what, what does Israel mean? What's the meaning of that word, that name? Huh? Wrestled, with God. Wrestled struggled with God. That wasn't given to Jacob so much as it was his descendants who would forever be struggling with God. And David's praying for his people in all of his, their troubles. Somebody read. Ah, we're out of time. We'll cover it later. I do want to go down and look at something here. And you can tell I had a little more. In Psalm 31, I want to read this myself, and then we'll be done. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness, mercy to me in a besieged city. If David was a, was a city, he would have troops surrounding him, trying to break the walls down. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. You know what supplications are? Prayer. But it's more than prayer. This is a prayer with pleading, begging, begging because of the condition that he's in. This is that poverty of spirit that we must have 
when we come to God. There can be no arrogance or self-sufficiency. We must appear this way to God. I am cut off from before your eyes. He remembered Saul. He remembered what happened when Saul took that one step too far. David always remembered the spirit of the Lord departing from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorizing Saul. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. Oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. Let the king of glory come into your life. And fully, uh, oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully recompenses the proud doer. I kind of think there's a negative here. You remember the, the uh, publican and the, and the sinner? Uh, and the, yeah, the sinner, the uh, par uh, Pharisee? Pharisee, oh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not like that guy. And he got his reward. He went away unjustified, but he got what he wanted, and that is he was better than somebody else. The publican, on the other hand, had no such attitude. He was not proud of heart the proud doer of the law. I pay my tithes, I pay my taxes, I pay my this, I do my deeds. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. Can you see the heart of David in all of these things? Take courage, all of you who hope in the Lord. I'll leave it at that. We have a lot to learn from great men of the Bible, David being one of them. If your heart is not right this morning, if you have not let the king of glory come in, make your life right today. Won't you come while we stand and sing this song? Yeah.